whole talk today is the frame. We we called it "You Will See Me," um, and we were we were playing with the fact that uh, a lot of black aesthetics has to do, particularly the our fashion aesthetic, our aesthetic when it comes to what we wear, has to do with being seen, or at least playing with the the idea of being seen. And so we invited them to talk um, to talk through that lens, through the work that they're doing, and. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Alma, and then after Alma, we're going to turn over to Brian. Cool. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to see everybody here. I've been looking forward to this talk for the whole since February, and I've been, that's my little nephew. Um, but I've been really excited about this talk, and um, it's been great to listen to the other talks that have happened in the last two weeks. Off would be great, yeah. Um, and I'm really excited to hear Barbara's talk tonight also. Um, and what I love most about this series is that, you know, you have people coming from different age groups, different backgrounds, but all interested in sort of the intersection of blackness and social justice. And so I'm really excited about learning from our conversation today. Let me just set this up. Cool. All right, so um, my talk is entitled Wax Print Cloth and the Politics of Authenticity. Um, a lot of the, of the, in the last two talks that came up, a lot of the discussion centered on the representations of Africa that come up in um, sort of the African American imaginary. And Seth, for instance, talked about the black arts movement in the 60s and 70s, um, while McCartney talked about um, imaginings of the black future. And, you know, they highlighted the richness that came from inspirations drawing from Africa, but then they also brought up some issues. Issues like the fact that oftentimes in these representations, um, Africa first is a unitary whole, right, instead of a place with multiple climates, hundreds of language groups, and so on. Um, but also that sometimes the images are hyper-masculinist, sexist, homophobic. Um, and that Africa, in general, is the static thing. Um, so as valuable as Africa has been in these representations, they're also, Najma brought up the point that we want to kind of remember critically, um, which I thought really captured what our challenge is. So today what I'm doing is um, zeroing in on one of the objects through which representations um, of Africa sort of happens, and that is wax print cloth, which, is, which many of you know as African print. So now with the lights off, you can't quite see it. But um, I trust that you took a look at it earlier. And actually, we'll turn the lights on in a second. Kenny or Najma, if that's OK. Tell me when. OK. Um, and what I'm going to be looking at is basically how the cultural authenticity of the cloth maps onto how we think about cultural identity as black people, West African, or African people. Okay. Um, but first, can we put on the light now, actually? I wanted to just find out, um, for you, when you see this cloth, you know, we also have some on chairs, so, you know, those of you sitting on a chair with the cloth, feel free to take a look at it and feel it and so on. But first, I want to find out what, what does this cloth um, evoke for you when, when you see it? Is that enough light? Yeah, that's great. What, uh, what do you think of when, when you see this cloth? So the color is just. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What else? Unique. 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 How? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So all of these qualify as wax print cloth, um, but you see a huge variance in the kinds of designs and the kinds of colors um, that are represented, and we'll go into that in much more detail. Um, anything else about what what this evokes? What does it make you think of? Do you think, I mean, I guess I've kind of given it away, but you know, Africa, maybe. Because <laughs> um, you know, in many, in many cases, you no know, wax print is one of these things that evokes Africa, and it's been. Um, you definitely think it's from Africa. You think it's from Africa. Yeah, it's totally from Africa. Right. And that's part of the reasons that, um, that it's, you know, it's 
it was used a lot um, in the 70s, for instance, you know, the dashiki um, as a way of kind of expressing cultural pride and um, black pride. In African countries um, in the 60s, right around the independences, um, at the state level, people were encouraged to wear wax print cloth, again, as a way of celebrating newfound independence and pride in African identity. Um, so then, you know, the question becomes, what, how does this cloth come to play the role that it plays? Um, and oftentimes, like Kenny was saying, we see this thing as an African object, and that's where its, um, its role comes from. But the story is a little bit more complicated than that, and the whole question of authenticity um, is a tricky one. So I don't know if off the bat, if I asked you, you know, what would make this cloth more or less authentic, um, what you'd say? Like, what do you think, like, when you're looking around, for instance, does something look less authentic than um, another? Does one design look somehow? Mm -hmm. The colors and the patterns and the way that they're kind of assembled. Yeah. Some make me question the origin. Uh, like, like, I know, like, the, the way the colors are used in this particular one are cool, but I'm, like, looking at the arrows, I'm like, arrows? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. So then I question, like, well, it may be this artists kind of version, but not necessarily. Mm-hmm. Right, so that's a really important point. Um, the designs, the images that are contained, but also the, the aesthetic of it, like the feel of it, the way the pieces are assembled, like you said, like the colors and so on. So there's something that looks real, but something that doesn't look quite right, right? What else? Um, what else might, or maybe they all look kind of about the same, about as authentic or real to you? In the back there, we have some clothes also hanging, so you see examples of things that are crafted out of this cloth. Um, later, there's one that, that has um, two pieces of cloth, but of the same design, but different feel. So I want you to take a look at that later. But I wanted to first kind of talk about um, how we might go about figuring out which of these um, is more authentic than the other. One way might be to think about where the cloth comes from, where the style comes from. So um, the prevalent theory right now about the origin of wax print cloth is that it's actually based on Indonesian hand printing techniques, right? Why Indonesia? It turns out that in the 19th century, Holland had colonies in the East Indies, which are now Indonesia. And at the time, the Suez Canal wasn't open, so in order to get there, they actually had to sail all around the African continent and stopped in Gold Coast, which is now Ghana, and um, in the south, you know, what is now South Africa and so on, before getting to the East Indies. And in the process, goods were just circulating, right? So they were bringing things back from the East Indies, they were bringing things back from Gold Coast. And one idea is that that's part of how the aesthetic of Indonesian wax print made its way to West Africa. Another thing is that at the time, there were also Ghanaian um, men, soldiers, fighting for the Dutch in Indonesia. And so after the war, went back to, got to their home countries or homelands and brought back Indonesian wives with them along with cloth, right? So um, here you see, for instance, what the Indonesian batik technique looks like. So there you have the stamps and it's literally being hand applied block by block. So if you look at this cloth back there, for instance, it has a very strong Indonesian batik um, feel to it. Huh? Um, just like this. You know, if I saw this on the street, I'd think African cloth. But it's an, it's an Indonesian batik, right? Um, which is kind of cool, I find. But part of the reason that this took in West Africa is also because West Africa has its own traditions of textile printing, right? So here you have indigo, tie-dye, and then you have block prints also, but that are just a different kind of printing. So these traditions were getting combined um, in West Africa, and what happens is that the Dutch initially intended to mechanize the process and sell it back in Indonesia, but it didn't take over there, and they realized that they could actually have a huge market in West Africa, and so they started producing specifically for West African market in the 1870s, right? So this has been going on for a long time. And here you see um, at this factory in, um, in the Netherlands, in Helmond, it's in the south of the Netherlands. These pictures are from like, I think the 1920s, 30s, I'm lying, 40s. 
And so you see a combination of both the how the process was mechanized, but then also almost an assembly line, right? You have this space of um, designers who are just in lab coats drawing these designs meticulously um, with a close-up there. So that gives you an idea of just the complexity of the origins of wax, right? We can't say it's from Indonesia. We can't say it's from West Africa. We can't say it's from Holland. It's blending all of these things, which is something that you were starting to hint at with, you know, there are pieces of it that make sense and pieces that don't quite make sense. Um, another way to think about whether a cloth is authentic might be to look at the actual images, um, as with the arrows. And here, um, I've tried to pair images that kind of look similar. So this is an Indonesian batik on top, and this is one of the classics, um, classic wax print designs that has been around for over 100 years. And you see kind of the striking aesthetic. Um, so Indonesian batiks were always inspiration, but also another way that inspiration came about for designers in the early days was through exhibits of African objects in museums in Europe, right? So this is um, a sketch I found, um, I was working in the archives in, um, of this company in the Netherlands last summer, and this is a sketchbook from the first head of the design department at the company from 1920. Um, from the late, actually late 19th century to early 20th. And in the margin, he actually wrote, you know, this is based on an exhibit of Nigeria and Congo at this museum in Brussels, right? Now, look at this design. It, you know, like nobody can convince me that there isn't a relation between these two. And this is one of the classic West African prints also, right? So it's being drawn by a Dutch man based on objects brought back from Togo to Europe and being adapted with the wax, the Indonesian Baltic aesthetic also. Other objects or other ways that wax prints came about <laughs> is um, inspiration, <laughs> right? It's kind of, it's a little bit like the arrow thing. But this is actually, you know, it's funny that you like it because this is actually one of the most popular. It was a very popular design in West Africa for a long time. And when they hit the market, it was called ventilateur, which is fan in French. And the story goes that the um, traders had wanted, or the middlemen um, kind of trading or moving goods from Europe to West African markets, came and said, you know, we want to design with fans, because fans are big right now in West Africa, and we want to design with fans. And none of the designers wanted to draw it, because they felt, you know, it's not really interesting, it's not, it's just not that challenging. And so this guy said, fine, I'll do it. And his big, and so he literally, I talked to him, he's like in his 80s now, and he got a fan from the store and drew it. And then after kind of going back and forth with people, he added these lines that give you a sense of the wind that's blowing. And this thing was a hit, right? It was massive. What, what date? Yeah, that, I mean, this is probably, you know, I don't want to lie to you, but I think it's at least, I think it's like the 80s. Yeah. Is it, from, is it Dutch? Yeah, this is Dutch wax. Wow. This is Dutch wax. So fans, but also video games, right? Um, this is another way that, right? Um, so if you would see, you know, if you saw this somewhere, would you think, ooh, African fabric? No, no but, <laughs> but it is, right? It's, it's Dutch wax print that's being sold in West African markets. Um, so everyday objects inspired um, the cloth, and also designers kind of drew just what they wanted to draw, right? So depending on their interest. So here you have two designers who were active um, between the 50s, so usually they worked for the entire career, so the 50s to the 90s. Um, so many different inspirations for cloth, not a single source, right? So you might think, okay, maybe we can also look at who owns these brands. Maybe that's another way of trying to figure out what's a more or less authentic brand. But clearly there's the Dutch, um, and I kind of, so Vlisco's the Dutch company, and I put that there kind of because they release a new collection every three months, and their current collection is called Silent Empire. Wow. Which, I know, I was, you know. <laughs> so the conspiracy theorism it was just kind of like, hmm. But so I couldn't help it, I had to put it there. But um, they have a new collection. No, it's not very subtle, huh? Um, the power of subtlety, <laughs> it's amazing. It's like, it's amazing. <laughs> um, Right, so there's Blisco, and they're currently the biggest, they're the main, because they've been around for the longest. So they've been around now for almost, or they've been printing this stuff for over 150 years. They used to make other textiles also before. Um, and they produce exclusively for African people, whether on the continent or in the diaspora. 